So maybe to start right. us off, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what you're doing currently, yeah. uh, some of your passions and, uh, and hopes. Great. Well, thank you, Rafael. Delighted to see you. And thank you for honoring this uh, day, because it's a special one. Guy Mathai Day, you said African Environment Day yeah. and World Wildlife Day. It's like a triple day. Um, a little about my, myself, I am a um, mother of two daughters. Uh, really proud of them and in many ways I consider myself a, one of the holders of Wangai Mathai's legacy. Uh, honored to have worked with her for 12 years every single day uh, that had 12 last years and it was eye-opening, uh, inspiring, it was uh, a learning moment for me because I had my background is actually in public health mm -hmm. and business and that's what I had studied. And I was home for a bit of a break after studying for a long time and working and feeling like I needed to think about what I wanted to do. And then my mother said, come, come and work with me. Just help me with this. Help me with this. You know how that goes. Yes, yes. yes. So in the process of working with her, I just got sucked into her work and life at the Greenbelt Movement. Yeah. And so spent those years um, really understanding what drove her, the passion, how she worked and how she, in many ways, embodied um, her passion. I mean, she in, was a good example of someone who was literally working at the exclamation point mm -hmm. of her passion. She was passionate about the environment. She was passionate about people, the most vulnerable, women, youth, yeah. um, those who are economically disadvantaged, and was always looking about at how she could use uh, what we now are seeing as nature mm -hmm. to to generate uh, income. So I spent quite a bit of time working with her. And then, of course, sadly, in 2011, she passed on. But we felt a very deep sense of gratitude mm -hmm. to have had that much time um, with her. So we set up the Wangai Mathai Foundation to continue her legacy. I continue to chair the foundation. And that work is focused on youth leadership and how we could... Um, inspire young people to unpack the message of Wangai Mathai's life for youth. So what was her message to young people and what did her life have to offer them? Persistence, patience, commitment, that nothing you can do without those big, big words. And so that to me remains the heart of the Wangai Mathai Foundation's work. And it's a slow moving, but it's there, it's keeping the flag going, the Green Belt Movement are also keeping the flag going. And now we're also proud for the Wangai Mathai Institute at the University of Nairobi that is training PhDs and master's students on how to take what they've learned in the classroom directly to the communities and not be focused on very theoretical work. So bridging the knowledge and practice gap at the Wangai Mathai Institute. Now what I do, uh, I spend my time continuing to follow the work of those organizations, but also now leading as regional director and vice president at the World Resources Institute, focusing on Africa and the growth of the World Resources Institute's work here. Now WRI is a research organization, so a lot of what we do is evidence building and then taking that evidence and saying, how do we influence how cities are evolving? How countries are prioritizing nature and how um, they are protecting the most vulnerable. So our strategy uh, for Africa at the moment is to catalyze inclusive transformation for Africa's people and landscapes. We play a catalytic role because what we offer is a lot of data layers that demonstrate certain things uh, make sense, that it makes sense to invest in a green future, that it makes sense for Nairobi as a city to plan for a green, low carbon future. Because if we don't do that, we risk facing a lot of uh, challenges and crises that would be hard to adapt if we don't do that now. So that's what I'm doing. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, the 3rd of March is, um, like I did say, Wangari Mathai's day, but yeah. it's also African Environmental Day, and this is the World, World Wildlife Day. Wildlife day. Yeah. Uh, what does this mean to you? 
Well, it means a lot. When the African Union um, designated uh, March 3rd, uh, which was already African Environment Day, that Wangai Mathai Day, was such a, a, a recognition of the contribution that she had made, the, the mark that she left for Africa's environment and what it means. And in many ways, Africa's wildlife, because the habitats that she fought so hard to protect, we know are so important for biodiversity. And so um, it's a special recognition. And I, uh, it's, it's an honor of, of great proportion to have come from the African Union um, and to be part of how we celebrate every uh, African Environment Day, along with Wangai Mathai Day. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, your late mother, Professor Wangai Mathai, would have uh, turned 81 on the yeah. of, uh, of uh, April. April. And you just mentioned that you did interact with her, of course, as a, a daughter, but also as someone who worked and worked with her yeah. in some of her, of her initiatives and, uh, and engagement. What are some of the words of wisdom? some of the, the inspirations that yeah, you got from her that still yeah. bring through today for you? You know, uh, so many. Um, and every time I'm asked that question, a different one comes. So mm -hmm. I'll just tell you the ones that are coming. But I, I yeah. mean, she always talked about patience, mm -hmm. commitment, and persistence. Yeah. And the hummingbird story, which many people know about, was in many ways the signature of the core message that she, she was consistently mm -hmm. conveying that don't be overwhelmed by the enormity of our situation. You know, just do the best you can. Do what you can. And if everybody does what they can, change will happen. And so I remember just always becoming oriented in many ways to this reality that I shouldn't be overwhelmed by the enormity of climate change. I shouldn't be overwhelmed by the enormity of the poverty challenge. But that I should ask myself, what can I do? What am I doing towards that, towards addressing it? And that that's enough if I'm doing my best with what I have from where I am. That was a really important piece of advice always. I mean, uh, uh, Professor Ongari Mathai was a fighter for justice, social justice, yeah. human rights, yeah. and of course, environmental, uh, environmental justice. And uh, she actually did suffer as a result of that. Yeah. She paid yeah. a, a heavy price. How did that shape your very own uh, outlook on how you engage, how yeah. you get involved in some of uh, the work that you're doing? Well, it was difficult. And, and I must say, Rafael, the, the fact that things are different now, I think you and I have it completely different mm -hmm. than they did. Um, the struggles that they had uh, and still persisted mm -hmm. were a lot more challenging. So I always feel like we don't have much of an excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, things are much better. I'm not at great risk. At least I don't perceive to be at great risk uh, and that and a lot has been given to me, so a lot is expected. So I, I, I really just think of the fact that, you know, they were blessed, they were protected, they were um, in a way where they needed to be, the courage they exhibited, uh, that I I in many ways we stand on their shoulders. And so I feel inspired by their struggle. Mm -hmm. I feel inspired by their journey. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we, I always used to say that if she came back and she saw us mm -hmm. still where she left us, that would be pretty disappointing. <laughs> so how can we make sure that we move things forward? We move, we advance things with what we have. And, and I'm, I'm not, you know, her struggles were difficult. She survived them. Mm -hmm. It was always amazing. Mm -hmm. So. I always feel that that was um, a blessing in many ways. And, and our challenge is to meet the challenges of our time with the same courage, maybe even more, because we have less to worry about. Maybe our challenges are different and the risks we face are different, but they're certainly not the same risks they faced. I mean, and you mentioned about continuing our legacy, and part of that uh, was the establishment of the Wangari Malai Foundation yeah. and the Green Belt Movement is yeah. still ongoing. What are some of the projects that uh, the foundation or the Green Health Movement is, yeah. uh, is running? And what right. are some of the uh, sort of highlights or achievements that you think you've, right. uh, you've made? You know, I'll, I'll start with the Green Belt Movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always really, in many ways, uh, inspired deeply by the fact that 40 years ago mm -hmm. or more now, they, she and, and, and others thought about the genius of the Greenbelt Movement. How do you mobilize local communities to restore their landscapes? 
was in 1977. Today, it is one of the most important in, in initiatives, strategies for addressing the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. They were ahead of their time. And I think the Greenbelt Movement's work today is more relevant, is central. Um, as an organization, it has struggled, as many organizations do. But I hope that its better days are ahead because the work of the Greenbelt Movement is today one of the most important for addressing climate change, important for Africa's uh, strategy towards addressing climate, uh, generating jobs for young people while restoring landscapes, reforesting, creating opportunities for ecotourism, uh, creating opportunities for medicines and, and other products that we get out of forests, creating opportunities for ecosystem services like water and food. We are literally well equipped because of the work of the Greenbelt Movement. Um, it wasn't lost to me that during the COVID, uh, the height of the COVID um, lockdowns and all of that, we had Karura Forest. Mm -hmm. Most of us had Karura Forest, we had Uhuru Park, we had City Park. People could go and God knows how important that was for our mental health. Mm -hmm. To be able to go and walk in nature had never been more important. We are not even aware yet of the damage that has been done to young children and even adults for not having spaces like that. How lucky were we that we had green spaces. Uhuru Park, often full. Karura Forest, most visited during that time. It was a wonderful outlet, but visionary, because it was 30 years ago when the fight was happening. So I really feel um, the Greenbelt Movement's work is, is on point and, and hopefully gets even more support now. The foundations work, I think, as well. We're the youngest continent on the planet. Mm -hmm. There is no continent as young as ours. The average age, 19 years old, of people on the African continent. The opportunities to engage that generation, to power the future of this continent, amazing. We can lose it too. We can be a, a source of frustration to that generation by not creating the enabling environment for that to happen. So our governance needs to recognize that. And, and the, the private sector creating opportunities and our universities and education systems equipping them with the 21st century skills so that they can take advantage of what's coming. But it is uh, for us at the foundation that how young people storm into this next generation is really important that they do so with a set of values and character that is intact, yeah. that they are driven by not a sense of self and selfishness and apathy about what's going on, but that we are sensitive to the fact that I'm not okay if you're not okay. I need to make sure that my fellow Kenyans, my fellow Africans are fine, that just because I'm okay and people are living in abject poverty, they have no water, they have no, is not okay, and that we must all storm and take charge. So I think for the foundation, it's about character building. How do we inspire young children? We start with children in schools. We're developing programming that will equip teachers to build a sense of emotional intelligence so young people can navigate their current situations and as they grow older, become even more sensitized and hopefully go into mainstream politics and change things uh, with a sense of deep sense of integrity and character. Thank you so much. I know we are talking about Professor, but uh, Professor Ongari Mathai, but you've also made uh, uh, your own mark. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, over the years, and just recently, it's just an, uh, over one year since your appointment to be the Vice yeah. President and yeah. Regional Director for Africa right. at the World Resource uh, Institute. What are some of your achievements uh, for the period that you've been there, and what's, yeah. what are some of your future plans? Well, I think, you know, I wish I wish we could have even done more. In this one year where we've been in lockdown, we were fortunate to be able to refresh our strategy. One of the first things I thought we must do is focus ourselves on fewer things, fewer places, and go deeper. So how can we be one centimeter wide and a meter deep and do things that are, are really transformative? So really orienting the team to this transformative agenda that what we do, we must touch on poverty directly. Whatever we do, we must begin to influence livelihoods for especially rural 
communities, the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been struck by the fact that if you look at the data, mm -hmm. a majority of the food eaten in all industrialized countries mm -hmm. is produced 80% by small scale farmers. And a majority of those 70% are women. What is the role of organizations like ours in catalyzing rural prosperity, mm -hmm. ensuring that women can break through the agricultural value chains, forestry value chains, and begin to really transform lives? Mm -hmm. Um, of youth, women, and, um, and the most economically disadvantaged. So I feel like we've really done a good job of defining our agenda and we are now really hitting the ground on very key initiatives. I'm particularly proud of our landscape watch work. This is going to be about restoration and how we equip both the implementers on the ground with the tools and skills and, and, and platforms that WRI has and research to be able to do what they do really well. And then also to work with government to help plan, monitor and implement restoration on the ground. So that's one of the things we're getting ready to do. The other is working with the planning departments and, and ministries of finance to see if we can make the case, because we've done it in Ethiopia, in Brazil, in Indonesia, for a low carbon growth pathway, that if we begin to make decisions today about energy choices, about how we move on manufacturing, about the signals we send for infrastructure development, that all of those decisions need to be part of a new climate economy, need to be part of a new way of thinking, so that we can build that in and lock ourselves into a, a greener pathway, and so that 50 years from now, we are actually heading in the direction we want. You know, we can make our, our ambitious targets and our ambitious plans for 2050, but if you're aiming for 2050, you have to aim at a certain trajectory. We have to get that trajectory right now so that we can get to our low carbon future. Thank you so much. When you are, you are an outstanding uh, uh, figure in the Kenyan, but also international environmental women, uh, social justice movement, but even intellectual uh, circles. What are some of your key achievements uh, that you can highlight? I know you're modest, but... For yeah, sure, it's sure hard to say my own it. achievements, yes. but I think I... I would like to believe that I have um, played a role in highlighting the, the se crucial role that youth mm -hmm. can play across uh, the, the transformation of Africa. I'd like to believe that I have played a role in highlighting the central importance mm -hmm. of landscape restoration mm -hmm. as a, a, a key part of Africa's transformation, but also as a key part of how we address the climate crisis. I've continued to be a, a, a champion of climate action uh, and, and more and more, uh, especially climate adaptation, that mm -hmm. we get the commitments to climate adaptation that we need. So I would consider myself a great advocate for, for Africa and the future of Africa, and certainly for, um, for the, the engagement, involvement of an inclusive transformation. I, I'm, I'm absolutely bullish about the fact that if we don't be, if we're not inclusive in how we develop our infrastructure and how we develop our country, then we will actually create a bigger problem with a huge division. This country is already extremely divided in terms of equity. Mm -hmm. We have to bridge that gap if we're going to move forward to a more prosperous mm -hmm. Kenya. And I think that picture is across uh, most of our countries on the continent. Oh, fantastic. And uh, January 2021 marked the start of uh, Paris Agreement uh, yeah. implementation. But uh, there are still many challenges, especially when it comes to financing. Uh, on some of the interventions to mitigate or uh, put a bigger dent mm. on the issues of uh, yeah. climate change. Uh, what gives you hope that we can meet the challenge of uh, climate change? And where in Africa can you say there are some good examples that uh, yeah. are emulate? Well, we have to be hopeful. I, I think, you know, I'm an optimist, mm -hmm. so I, I really <laughs> op operate from a place of hope. Um, I think the COVID crisis has demonstrated, first of all, just how connected we all are. Um, that we are not going to be safe if only a few are safe and that we are all in this together. The central role that multilateralism plays in making sure that we move everybody to a better place and that um, a little virus can come from one place and completely stop the rest of us in our tracks 
ought to remind us that there is something uh, connected about us. And so I have hope that uh, the commitments that have been made and were made in Paris will be made uh, and met, that we will put even more emphasis on adaptation because climate change is happening. I don't know if you've been watching the nightmare in Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, the energy crisis in Texas is a really stark reminder, Raphael, of are we ready for climate change? It doesn't give you time. It doesn't give you time to adapt. You hear about people burning their tables to stay warm. People lost their lives because it got so cold. In this, the most industrialized country in the world. We have got to take climate change seriously. And the adaptation of the worst case scenarios, we have to think through a disaster risk preparedness scenario that ensures that we are prepared for anything. Nobody thought Texas would freeze over and here now. So we have to look at the possibility of freezing, mm -hmm. but also the possibility of droughts, extreme droughts, uh, disruptions in our food chains. What, what does that mean for our food systems, our water systems, and our resi the resilience of water systems? What do we need to do now? to begin to prepare. What we know and is, is frightening mm -hmm. is that uh, Africa will be most disproportionately affected by climate change, even if we've done the least, and even if we were to put a stop to it now. Yeah. The cascading um, impacts are, are coming. We have to really begin to prepare for that. And what that means is significant finances, a significant increase in climate finance. So we have to keep putting a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. On, on our development partners and certainly on developing countries, the richer countries, to, to put a price on carbon mm -hmm. and to begin to limit mm -hmm. and to decarbonize their economies. Mm -hmm. They have to do that. They have to get very ambitious mm -hmm. on their national determined contribution because they're the ones who are polluting uh, and, and, and uh, spewing out most of the carbon that is causing the problem. But we also then have to prepare and we need the support, as was outlined by the Paris Agreement, to do that. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, uh, January also marked the start of uh, trading under the African continental free trade, free trade uh, yeah. area. Uh, of course, there is the need and the urge for industrialization on the continent yes. to lift millions of yeah. Africans uh, from uh, poverty. How do you balance that with the need to also protect uh, the environment? The good news, Rafael, is that we can do both. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a, there's, it's a false choice. I think the new climate economy analysis, analysis that we're doing across different economies in Africa, in Ethiopia, that's demonstrating that it's not a trade-off. It's a, it's a false choice between yeah. and protecting the environment and that, in fact, we can enhance uh, economic development and climate resilience if we uh, put in place certain priorities now. So I think we absolutely um, can do it. Now, the, the, and it, 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 the choices we make now are, are, the, are important in how we prioritize the signals we send for investments so that we can begin to build that resilient future. I think that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement um, opens really important, exciting opportunities for intra-Africa trade. Yeah. At the moment, uh, intra-Africa trade is at 15%. Only 15% of our trade is within our fellow African uh, with our fellow African countries within Africa. In many countries like Europe, in regions like Europe, it's 80%. In Asia, it's 60%. There is a lot of room for growth for us to trade with our partners. And we've got to, however, address the implementation. There's got to be the political will to implement. The agreement is great, but it's only as good as your willingness to implement it. And so I hope that the, the implementation will go as flawlessly as has the announcement that the agreement is now in force and, and that we will see um, the elimination of non-trade barriers that have kept uh, prices so high for commodities that we could be purchasing. I heard recently it's cheaper for South Africa to buy rice from Vietnam mm -hmm. than to buy rice from Senegal where it is as good, the rice, but it's more expensive. That's unacceptable. We've got to make it possible. For Africa to transform itself, we need to trade. We need to up the trade, there is room, but we need to create the opportunities for that trade to happen. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, when you're, you've also been working with um, uh, young people, yeah. and uh, mostly talented young environmentalists in terms of helping them to, to change the course of history, but also to shape, um, to shape the, the future. And there's an emergence of uh, 
uh, really young champions of uh, climate action uh, and yeah. environment. What's your message to young people? Well, I think young people have the, um, first of all, they're creative, they're mm -hmm. innovative. Mm -hmm. I heard recently, Raphael, that Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa mm -hmm. were hugely benefiting last year, hugely benefited from um, investments for new ideas, mm -hmm. innovative, especially in the digital space. Mm -hmm. The digital transformation will make a huge difference in how Africa transforms itself. Mm -hmm. Young people have the skills, the knowledge, the interest, mm -hmm. uh, the creativity, the energy mm -hmm. to do it. So I, I just hope that we can create the sort of platforms that allow them to find full expression for their creativity. Um, just find a passion and pursue it. That's my advice. I think for many of them, you have all these opportunities ahead of you, but identify what really drives you and do it. I'm always inspired by a young man who I met, um, who is in the um, dairy industry, Alex. Alex Gadi is in the uh, in the dairy industry, and he has created for himself uh, an opportunity within the cow. How do you optimize dairy production in agriculture? And is doing really well for himself. What are the opportunities across different sectors where young people can find uh, economic? opportunity and prosperity. It's entirely possible, uh, but we need to help drive that and, and invest in that um, because we are actually a very young population, so we need to, to engage them. Uh, finally, uh, and thank you so very much, uh, finally, as the world remembers uh, uh, Professor Ongari Matai, what's your main message uh, to citizens of the globe? Well, let's keep the faith. I think that the, the um, she was always so hopeful mm -hmm. about um, about the future of this continent. She always reminded me, we traveled a lot all over the world and we would always look back and think, oh, how lucky we are mm -hmm. to have the most beautiful country, the most beautiful continent, the most diverse continent. Um, it is such a an important thing to remember. We are blessed with the best weather in the world, the best... Uh, brains and and yet we have not been able to crack through what's holding us back let's keep the faith and 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 push on and push for better governance push for better um, engagement ourselves get involved in places that you feel uh, inspire you because the future of this continent is great um, and then so many moments I wake up here in Nairobi and I think how lucky am I to be here when you read about what's going on in the rest of the world and you think, here we are, and we should make sure that everybody in this country, on this continent, gets the same feeling about where they are. This is, this is where it's at for us. We've got to make this work so that we can enjoy it, we can thrive in it for generations to come. Let's not look elsewhere. This is it.